the recording now. There we go. All right. Well, welcome everyone uh, to the Affordable Materials Grants Interest Meeting. Uh, thanks for coming. I, I'm really glad to see you all here. I've already seen 20 people in this meeting, and that is wonderful. We want as many people as possible to know about our grants, and therefore we can uh, help as many people as possible do awesome things. Uh, so I'm Jeff Gallant. I'm the Program Director of Affordable Learning Georgia. Uh, here today is uh, Nikita Afaha, our Program Manager for Affordable Learning Georgia. Uh, and we're here to uh, let you know about these grants and also answer any questions that you have. Uh, I see quite a few people who are new and that's awesome. Uh, there are some people in here who probably have received a grant before or applied before. So some of this might be a review at that point, but we have some changes, so it'll be uh, interesting for all. So in the chat, let's uh, do some introductions. Let's share your institution and your department, uh, whether or not it's your first time with ALG or if you're coming back, and why are affordable and open resources important to you? And Nikita just said, welcome all. She's also pointing out that the chat is right there. Thank you, Amy, uh, from Georgia Southern School of Earth, Environment, and Sustainability. Excellent. I need a change. I want something more accessible for all my students. Uh, accessibility is a huge part of this. Uh, Heather Bono from oh, UWG Accounting and Finance. Excellent. Uh, Hope Ridley from University of West Georgia Career Services. Cool. Uh, William Carter, a lecturer of English at Kennesaw State, uh, a big uh, participants in our grant program. Excellent. Uh, Clayton State College of Business for Melva Robertson. Very cool. Uh, Nancy Remler. Hello again. Uh, Georgia Southern College of Education. Want to expand the OER the team created in 2022. Oh, yep. Shirley Tian, uh, Kennesaw State in IT. Uh, a uh, zero cost materials degree program over at Kennesaw State. Um, yeah, Kimmy Collette's from Perimeter College, GSU, and Life and Earth Sciences. Uh, yeah, these resources are important because the majority of students she works with have limited income, are already struggling to pay for their education. Uh, Karen's from, oh, Karen Fisher is from Georgia Southern Elementary and Special Ed, making college more affordable and inclusive. Uh, Karen Siegler from KSU and Communication and Media, another big uh, OER champion uh, organization there. Communication has done some really cool stuff. Returning to ALG, accessibility is key. Yeah. Uh, Jim Davis from Kennesaw State Theater and Performance Studies. Excellent. Uh, looking for ways to keep general education, theater, and society priced down. Uh, Robert Saunders from Augusta University in Music. Having trouble ac uh, accessing the expensive materials that are currently available. Looking for some solutions. Uh, Efren Velasquez at uh, North Georgia Department of Psychological Science. We've got Matt Franks from UWG Department of English, Film, Languages and Performing Arts, uh, looking for accessibility and free materials. Uh, we've got someone from Perimeter College Office of Grants. Excellent. Uh, William Carter. Uh, yep. Once uh, he's, he's loaned book to students as before because uh, they could not afford the text. Yeah. Uh, Chris Palmer, Kennesaw State. Um, yep, developing workbook materials for teacher education in English. Excellent. Uh, also from Kennesaw State, Dahu, uh, providing no cost and easily accessible materials. Uh, Uli Ingram, hello. <laughs> uh, from KSU, OER veteran of sorts, uh, created some amazing GIS materials already. Now considering applying for a research grant. Uh, Chizara Jones from Clayton State University, first time with ALG. Well, welcome. Uh, Greg Mayer, academic professional at Georgia Tech, uh, waiting, oh, wanting to further an existing OER initiative. Excellent. 
uh, Kevin Frazier at Augusta University's Dental College of Georgia. The first time uh, anything we can do to help control the costs of the high high quality ed programs is a win win. Yes, for sure. Oh, hello again, David Doral. Uh, and interested in revising the OER textbook, Intro to Human Geography, I believe. Uh, Dr. Lee is here from Kennesaw State's IT department. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mizogi from uh, GSU Perimeter and Physics. Very cool. Up, oh, Todd Lindley. Yep. Hello again for Human Geography. 70,000 downloads and counting. Excellent. Um, Dr. Lockamy from Perimeter. Yep. Students are spending more and more on books. They read less and less. Um, Dr. Chakraborty, welcome back uh, from VSU Physics and Astronomy. Looking for homework and platforms in physics, educational research involving OER. And Dr. Weatherford, also welcome back from the UGA New Media Institute, revising web development OER. Very cool, amazing group of people here today. I'm seeing 44. Wow, 45. Hello. Hi, Dr. Lange from Georgia Southern. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to get going. <laughs> I, this is absolutely record attendance uh, for an interest meeting. I don't think we've ever seen this, even for round two back in the day. Uh, that's very cool. Um, so I'm going to take you through the three different types of grants that we have, what they do, and uh, which one you would probably want to apply for. Transformation grants are the first one that we ever had. Uh, they're all about transforming your entire course uh, that had commercial materials uh, that were expensive to courses using OER and other affordable materials. And that means low cost commercial materials sometimes too. Uh, as uh, Dr. Hollingsworth said here, considering using both low cost and no cost resources for accounting now, oh, cool. Now there are, when you're applying for transformation grants, four priority categories that you can fall into when you're applying. Um, they receive a bit of priority for fitting a strategic goal, but they are not requirements. Now, I wanna put this up front because when you're applying for a transformation grant, you might look at these priority categories and go, well, this doesn't meet all four of these, so I guess it doesn't qualify. And that is not the case. If you have a great grant proposal and you do not fit these four categories, you still have a great shot. We would much rather have an impactful proposal than uh, a proposal that doesn't do that much and meets all of these categories. So they're not requirements. They help a little bit um, because we would love to see it, but it's not something that would disqualify you if you don't fit one of these categories. So. Uh, there are collaborative projects in transformation grants. So if you bring folks into your team that aren't just uh, faculty within your department, such as instructional designers, super helpful folks, librarians, publishers of OER, like the UNG Press or the UGA Press, uh, instructional technologists, web designers, uh, programmers, if you're creating uh, game-based materials or simulations, uh, graphic designers, if you're creating uh, some really nice looking, engaging uh, texts and things like that. Uh, bringing folks in who aren't just teaching the course can really make the project more interesting for you and also more successful in the long run. Uh, student participation in materials, creation, adapt, uh, adaptation and evaluation. So this is not just having your students uh, answer a survey at the end of the semester that says, you know, that's part of the uh, uh, evaluation of your course. This is more that you're involving students in creating new materials or revising them or editing them, evaluating them. Uh, sometimes that means bringing them in as student assistants. Sometimes that means involving the class in a an exercise in open pedagogy where they're creating and teaching at the same time and therefore learning more. Uh, oh, we've got some uh, talk about physics materials. Excellent. Uh, yeah, and yeah, so this would be where students are very active participants in the proposal itself. Departmental scaling projects. So some of you may have already put OER into your courses, but you want to step it up and bring it to the entire department. But in order to do so, you may have to do a lot of work on the back end, uh, talking with folks, 
You may need to do a lot of organization, creating new materials so that everybody can participate. Um, that's going to be a, a much bigger project. You do need to have a commitment from the department. Uh, so that does need to be indicated in the proposal that they're going to at least pilot this project in all sections for this category. Um, a departmental scaling project can't be, well, it might be adopted if everybody likes it. This has to be a thing where the whole department says, we're going to try it. That doesn't mean that it's going to always be implemented forever until the end of time, but it does mean that for one semester, everybody's using these materials. And then the last one is upper level campus collaboration. So if you're transforming your course and it's an upper level course, often you're not affecting as many students as you would in an introductory course. And the amount of students you affect and how much you're saving them per semester is a big part of a transformation grant. But we do place uh, more emphasis on these upper level courses because they are under, uh, well, they're underexplored in OER. They, there aren't as many open educational resources for these major specific courses uh, for like stuff that is really important, but isn't necessarily right at the front door of uh, every institution's course schedule. So uh, you would really want to collaborate with folks who also teach the course at other institutions in this category. You, you have to collaborate between institutions, and that's so you are creating uh, more impact there, and you have folks on your team for something that you may only be uh, the one instructor for at your institution. So that's the upper level campus collaborations one. I don't want to emphasize these too much in the presentation. I know I'm kind of putting it up front, but this is part of the transformation grants application process, and they're they're helpful, but they are not required. Now, how does funding work for transformation grants? Well, it's 5000 maximum per individual team member, and that includes your salary, your course release, your travel, anything that is associated with that to you. Uh, there are additional project expenses allowed. Um, if you have them, you got to make sure that even if they're already listed in the budget, you have to put in the narrative and in the plan where those things are going to help. So if you uh, put a $3,000 expense for uh, some equipment and software programs, and that's nowhere in your plan and the proposal, then peer reviewers and us, we're going to look at it and go, well, where the heck is this? Uh, how is it going to help? We have no idea. So be sure to justify this in um, both your, your budget and in the application itself. Now, the entire project, including any additional project expenses, uh, it maxes out at thirty thousand dollars per grant, um, but yeah, you can you can start as low as just having uh, one individual team member transforming their course for a max of five thousand. So yeah, if you have other project costs, you can incorporate those expenses into the grants. Just make it very clear um, where these fit into your plan and why they're necessary. Now we'll go into continuous improvement grants. This is the second category. Um, this one is for folks who have already put low cost and no cost materials into their courses, but they say, well, we need to make this more sustainable, more engaging. Uh, it, we need to make this more current, more accessible. It's a way to improve these courses by revising OER or creating new OER. I'm glad that we've got uh, some discussions on on platforms here. That's really cool. And this is between Georgia State and Valdosta State. That's excellent. So continuous improvement grants aren't just about, well, we're going to do a course revision and therefore we're going to do our normal course revision work. Revising OER can be a lot more interesting than that. Uh, if you have an entire open textbook, and it's something that's very sensitive to changes in the news and time, you know, political science, sociology, um, new advances in biology and immunology and stuff like that are coming every uh, every month, it seems, because of you know changes to the pandemic and vaccines and all that. Like you would 
definitely want to keep those updated for your students as you keep going through. That would be a substantial revision of existing OER. Uh, so, you know, you can do updates for accuracy, uh, for currency, about the same thing when it comes to being accurate, uh, making it more accessible. Maybe you have an old PDF and nobody can really use a, they can't even use a screen reader to read it or anything like that. Maybe you're making a very widely accessible new version of that resource. That's totally fine. You can do that in a CI grant. Um, clarity, you know, making sure that there's, um, a more singular voice in a textbook that was written by 10 people. That's absolutely, that's substantial work. Um, doing an entire design overhaul on it. Maybe it's instructional design or graphic design. Uh, then also just compatibility. So if you have something that was in D2L and you've got these text files and they kind of can be shared out with the public, but not really, uh, maybe you're making an entirely new version of it uh, for that. That's perfectly fine. You can also create new OER. For example, um, Georgia Highlands has been using quite a bit of open educational resources for their history courses. And those are like super good implementations already. But what they wanted to do was make an entire video series and have like channels on YouTube to share them out. And so they did that in continuous improvement grants. They did video creation which of course really helps them when everybody moved online during the pandemic too. Um, and you can create these types of ancillary materials, uh, things like uh, question banks that could be helpful for both you and for others in implementing your uh, open educational resources. Uh, you could do sets of lecture slides that are narrated. Uh, that would be perfectly good uh, for accessibility, uh, good for formatting, you know, doing a podcast series, your creativity is, is the limit here. Now, the funding structure for these is a little bit smaller. Uh, we used to call these our mini grants, and now we focused more on the function of them as opposed to the size. Uh, so the maximum is 2000 per team member, and that includes salary, course release, travel, etc. Um, there are additional project expenses allowed, but just like with transformation grants, you have to justify those in the proposal budget. Uh, max award of 10,000. Now here, you don't have those strategic priority categories. This is more about the project and the cool stuff you're going to make. It's going to be evaluated more on the teaching and learning impact. Um, we're not so concerned that uh, you have collaborative partnerships in place because you probably will if you're creating something uh, at a really cool scale. You'll need some uh, resources to help out with creating something like uh, a video series. Now there is an entirely new category called research grants this year. And this has been a long time coming. We've been thinking about ways to move research forward um, within ALG. There are already plenty of like great peer reviewed articles published out there on various uh, types of implementations of OER and low cost materials uh, by USG faculty who have gotten uh, a grant before. But we haven't been able to support more folks going out there and doing what these folks have done. Uh, really getting the ball rolling on research, answering those big questions of exactly how this stuff works. So research grants are, they are opportunities to explore these research questions that you have about things in ALG, especially open education, open pedagogy, uh, affordable materials related topics, uh, things like courseware efficacy, stuff like that. They all have to address something in the open education groups KU framework. That's cost, outcomes, usage, and perceptions. The article that I have linked is a scholarly article that surveys the literature based on the coup framework. At the moment, the Open Education Group's website is being uh, revised, so things are kind of down at the moment, so that's why I have it linked to an article. But if you have any questions about the coup framework, please let me know, uh, and I will be glad to help you out with that. And these research projects are going to end with a research report. So they're not, it, it doesn't have to end with something already being published in a journal. That stuff takes a while 
takes a lot of back and forth editing and revisions and, and such. We want a research report that talks about the stuff that you've done in a nice narrative way uh, that's openly accessible to folks. Now, you're not going to have to share things like uh, data sets and supplementary files. Uh, we especially want to be protective of personally identifiable information. We don't want uh, any students' information getting out there to the public that uh, is not out there already. So yeah, uh, unless you want a data set to be shared, something that is already anonymized and uh, would be helpful in understanding the research project, you don't have to share those out. The research report is going to be a, a template. Uh, it'll be a word template, an easy one to fill out. It'll be a set of information about the project team, you know, basic stuff. Who are you? What's your contact info? That kind of thing. Then there's going to be a summary. It's going to be two or three paragraphs, not anything gigantic. You don't have to write an article here. This is absolutely not a dissertation. Um, this is about the goals that you had set, uh, the research questions you were going to answer, um, the research design that you created, uh, any methods, any data analysis techniques that you used, um, any findings, uh, applicability. So, you know, the implications. So kind of a rundown, not quite an abstract, a bit longer than that, but not a full article. Something that will let everybody know what happened. And hopefully if it gets published um, or presented on, then we're going to link that right there with the uh, research report itself. So that if uh, someone reads the research report and goes, hey, that's really cool. If it got published after that, then they're going to go and read that too. So not only are we trying to get some research going, but we're trying to enhance the discovery of uh, publications once that's all done. And be sure to include things like, uh, you know, describing any files that you provided, uh, any future plans um, for this research afterwards. Now, there are some extra considerations when you're doing a research report proposal. Um, be sure to know your IRB guidelines and work with your IRB on the approval of any activities in these projects. Even if you think that something's going to be exempt, uh, be sure to check in uh, with your IRB. Now, how IRBs work, it depends on the institution. And that's why we can't just go, OK, well, send it in to the USG IRB. They'll approve it. That's not how it works. It's each institution does its own thing. So have that in your plans and have that in your understanding before you send in a proposal. And when you're publishing uh, journal articles, uh, we would prefer that you publish in an open access publication. Um, but there are varied options out there for folks. If you're in education and we're uh, and you're exploring things in open ed, there's some cool open education journals out there you can publish in, and those are wonderful. But you may be in a department where there are a particular set of journals that everybody publishes in, and those are the most important ones for tenure and promotion, and they may not have the same options. That's not going to dock you in the process. That's not going to be uh, you know, a violation of any requirements. It's not a requirement. We would love stuff to be open access because then you can just point right to it and people can read it immediately. But if you are uh, publishing in something that isn't open access, that is also OK. It's better that you are exploring these topics using cool research methods uh, than it is to just have open access articles out there. We love it, but also it's not always the reality of the situation. The funding structure is the same as our continuous improvement grants. We actually were going to add this to the continuous improvement grant category. But there were so many different guidelines and it was such a different function that we decided, OK, we're going to separate this out. So the budget is the same. Uh, project expenses still uh, need to be justified in the proposal budget, and there's still a $10,000 maximum total award per, uh, per grant. Now here's a little bit on how the funding works. So the funding does not go directly to you. It goes to the institution. And the institution then covers your time, your project expenses per the proposal. They had already agreed to do so in the service level agreement. 
um, when they sign it and when the USG signs it. And that's how this project gets done. The cool thing about this is that let's say there's turnover in your team, your department, you got a really big team and somebody, you know, moves out to Kansas and teaches there. Um, that's going to be OK. You can bring somebody else in and the institution can uh, can deal with that kind of switching around. That's the, the really nice part about it. If we were doing direct stipends, it would be really tough line item management between uh, everybody involved. Now, the funding is 50% at the beginning, 50% at the end. So on execution of the SLA, which means that both parties have signed, we can then get an invoice from your institution and we will pay that invoice. That's the first 50%. When the final report comes in, you let your offices know that the final report is done. They will send an invoice. We will get the invoice and we will pay the invoice once that's all done. So that that is how it works. Now, sometimes uh, things, as I will say a lot in here, things will vary per institution. So these budgets are supported by state funds. So everyone is already in compliance with uh, border regions policies and state policies through their grants offices and their business offices. That's how they operate. So it's the same thing there. Now, this doesn't usually include the USG guidelines for federal grants and external grants. If you've been on an NSF grant or a National Endowment for the Humanities grants or a Hewlett Foundation grant, those are different because the work is being asked from an external organization. And at that point, there's a lot more stuff that has to be done in uh, you know, seeing who uh, who this is, managing the funds uh, of an external organization can be a lot of work. Now, your institution may still follow all of the federal and external grant uh, processes for USG grants. That's just kind of their uh, prerogative to do so. Uh, we can't change that. They will follow those guidelines uh, if that's the case. So be sure, uh, as we require, to contact your grants or business office about your project and what you're going to propose before you send in the proposal, because that's super important stuff. Now, funding is direct only. They cannot include indirect expenses. Now, here's the important thing about the difference between direct and indirect expenses. Direct expenses fund the project and what is taking place. It funds your time. So things like uh, everything that's going to be in your budget, salaries, project supplies. Uh, you know, if you're funding a student assistant, that's a direct expense. But it's not just the direct salary that comes to you. Fringes go with salary. Uh, if someone's going to be paying you through payroll, that includes, as part of it, taxes, uh, including Social Security stuff. Uh, including um, FICA Med, that that kind of thing still comes out of this uh, these expenses. Those are not indirect expenses. If you see taxes when it when you are paid by your institution, those are also direct. They are required and associated with paying you. Um, so that's just a really important distinction. Indirect expenses are when an external organization asks for members of an institution to do some work. They fund the work that's being done, so they fund that time. But the institution, of course, has to take care of keeping the lights on. If you're being supported by an external organization to run uh, you know, any kind of STEM experiment, you probably need a lab. And that lab needs very specific equipment, and that needs maintenance, and that needs parts and all kinds of stuff. So there is a particular facilities and administration cost that institutions will put onto any kind of external grant proposal. Those are not part of a USG grant. We're all part of the same organization in this case. Uh, so facilities and administration or F and A, those are the ones that are not counted. They, they are not funded because those are indirect expenses. But things like taxes and Social Security and FICA Med, those are things that are included as part of the direct expenses. I'm saying this because we get questions about this all the time. 
um, just to make sure. So we talked about the three categories of grants. We even talked about the priority categories in transformation grants. Uh, we talked about how the funding works. So what does the timeline look like? Well, Monday, October 30th at midnight, so not quite Halloween, but we're going to be looking them over on Halloween. Um, that's the application deadline. On Tuesday, November 21st, notifications get sent out. Whether you were accepted or not, you're going to get an email notification. Uh, the peer review process happens in between and the administrative review process happens in between. Um, a week after that, we're going to send out agreements for signatures. Uh, these are the service level agreements. We want to make sure that these are agreed upon and signed by both parties as soon as possible because funding isn't possible until those get signed. Now, the online kickoff meeting um, is kind of a welcome meeting for everybody. Uh, we all get to know each other. We all describe our projects. We ask, we ask each other questions. Uh, we talk about the first steps in this project. This used to be kind of directly after the application process. And we're moving that a little bit out towards a more comfortable time to do it. It'll be January 5th so that you don't have the kickoff and then the holiday break and then you come back and, you know, all of a sudden spring semester is running. We're going to do this a little bit at the beginning or a little before the spring semester starts. Um, that that way everyone's able to check in in a much more comfortable way than uh, throwing it at the end of December. But the difference here between this and previous rounds is that we're doing the service level agreements early and the kickoff later. That means that during the kickoff, we're going to be doing a lot more um, talking, a lot more getting to know each other and a lot less talking about what the service level agreement document is. You'll you'll see that in our instructions. Um, then we'll have a midpoint check in uh, halfway between the uh, start of the project and the end of the project in July. We'll all check in to see how things are going. It might be a time to uh, refocus folks on uh, a particular thing, get your whole team together to talk about uh, problems that you've encountered along the way. Uh, it's it's a good time for us to all kind of get back together and see where we are. And then on December 20th, 2024, so this is after grades happen and all that, um, reports and materials for your project uh, will be due. So this is uh, for projects ending in fall 2024. Now, uh, continuous improvement grant folks can choose for their projects to end at the end of the summer semester. That's a little bit earlier. Um, you know, I would I would suggest taking the whole year unless you know that you've got uh, a thing that's going to happen during these months and that's when it's going to be. So for the kickoff, we need at least one team member from each team to participate. Uh, but we will also have asynchronous training. Uh, it's web based stuff that you will be uh, reading, watching uh, through videos and stuff like that, and then filling out a couple of quizzes at the end. Uh, this is part of the kickoff requirements, just so that we are all on the same page about what an open educational resource is, how copyright works, accessibility uh, is a big part of it too. So yeah, making sure that all folks fill out the asynchronous training. Now, if you've already done this within the same year, you're exempt from having to do it again. Uh, we will be changing stuff within a year or so, or at least it's assumed that stuff would change. So you would have to do it if you're out of a year past that point. All right, so now we're going to move on to applying for a grant. But before that happens, are there any questions about funding, the timeline, or the types of grants before we move on? Uh, just share them right in the chat. Uh, OK, Dr. Palmer says to do, do the transformation or continuous improvement grants presume that the target course is fully OER. 
We're considering creating no cost workbook materials uh, for an existing course that uses a commercial textbook. Unsure if the categories may apply to a situation. So no cost and low cost materials apply just as much as OER. I think OER is a great option. Uh, it is not the be all end all requirement for these grants. So yeah, um, using no cost workbook materials, that's totally fine too. Uh, but the, the thing it, that's different about this question, um, if you are implementing materials in place uh, of others, right? But you're still using a commercial textbook and the cost is still high, um, you wouldn't uh, at you would at least not want to uh, apply for a transformation grant because you're not saving your students any further money. You're just increasing uh, no cost materials, right? But if you're not creating OER or improving OER, it would be tough to do a continuous improvement grant because then you're just uh, using no cost or creating no cost workbook materials. Yeah, so this may be an interesting one. Uh, send me an email about more about this project because we want to make sure that that you're applying for the right thing um, and that you're making it clear to reviewers too. Yeah, this this seems like it might be an interesting one. Cool. Yeah, uh, my email, I'm just going to put it right here. We have it at the end and the beginning of this presentation, but there it is. Um, OK, uh, Dr. Mizogi says, uh, what about funding for student help and the limits of that? Um, funding is the same as if it were per team member, but the difference with students is that you know they can come and go. I would say when you're applying to have students help you out as part of the team, say that it is a student assistant, a graduate assistant, something like that. Uh, so that you're not just saying, OK, this person is a member of the team and then that person has gone the next semester, then you have to add another one. That person has gone, you have to add another one. And then you're you're funding multiple people using one line. Uh, just um, say exactly how many student assistants or graduate assistants you are going to have in terms of that position. Don't worry too much about the names of students because folks are in and out of institutions quite a bit. Does that make sense? Dr. Chakraborty uh, says, can we partner as a team with someone outside of the USG system? You totally can partner uh, with people outside of the USG. Now, institutions may do this differently. Most of them have said that when they bring people from outside of the USG system, the best way to do so is to bring them in as a contractor um, that's just kind of the business process for that. Now, the thing about including folks outside of the USG system is if you're applying for a transformation grant and you're providing data on how many students are affected and how much that's going to save students, you can't use non-USG figures in there because this is USG funding. It is directed to reduce the cost for USG students. The data that we uh, share with everyone else and the data that we are making judgments on has to do just with the USG. So if you're saving, um, you know, let's say you're saving 10 students uh, $100 on textbooks through uh, a transformation grant proposal at VSU, and then you're saving uh, 1,500 students at Harvard the same amount of money, that Harvard data does not count. Uh, when it comes to evaluation and when it comes to our data. So that's that's an important point. You can bring folks in, but the impact data is all USG. Thank you. All right, I'm going to move on, but if you do have any other questions or you're still typing it in chat, that's totally fine. So this is the application process part of it. So be sure to bookmark this page. It is the apply for a grant page. It's on our new website. If you have old links, this is a new one. And this one says apply for a grant. It's not round 24. It is just here's how you apply for a grant. Um, there is an offline Word document proposal. 
that's the first thing that you're going to want to fill out. Um, when you get that all filled out, you're going to have your entire proposal ready to go. At that point, you can run it by everybody so you can get your letter of support ready, get your grants or business office acknowledgement form ready. Um, they will uh, then have all the information they need to uh, let you know any advice they have, uh, things about policies and procedures, because you already have your proposal ready. That's the best way to do it. You can also just run an idea by uh, these folks and get your letters and forms signed early, but I would much rather you all have a completed proposal to share with folks. Then you'll use the online form uh, to officially apply for a grant. Uh, you're going to be attaching your Word document proposal. This one, so the online form in some ways is for us. We're the ones that take in a big Excel sheet and we're able to do some tracking stuff here, some dating data stuff here, not dating stuff. Um, and then uh, we're able to um, put that all together for when folks are awarded a grant. Uh, we're able to contact you very easily. But the Word document proposal, that's the one that's going to go to reviewers. Uh, because that has all of the information that a reviewer would need to evaluate the proposal. Uh, they don't have to sift through a lot of Excel stuff that we would need and that others might not. Uh, there are rubrics for this and you definitely should check them out. I've got little screenshots of them here just in case. Um, but here, uh, the Transformation Grants one does include student savings impact, so affecting large numbers of students, um, making changes in student savings. That's a big part of it and making sure that those estimates are clear. Uh, that will be included in, in the rubric, so be sure to check that one out. This is on the same page, the Apply for Grant page. Um, continuous Improvement Grants only have one peer reviewer as opposed to the three on uh, Transformation Grants. And uh, yeah, this is also a weighted rubric, but it focuses more on teaching and learning impact and whether or not everything is organized and feasible. There isn't a student savings impact thing because it's assumed that you're already saving students money um, with using a low cost or no cost course. You're there to improve that. Research grants have a new rubric. This, this slide is cursed. I've redone it, uh, I think three times and I tried to re-upload it and the screenshot is just bad. It's just always blurry. Um, but just take it from me, there is a research topic impact uh, part in the rubric, and of course the uh, qualitative and quantitative methods are another big part of this. Be sure to check out the research grant rubric. I, I swear it is not this blurry in the Word document. So let's take a look at the application itself. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here in a second. Here we go. And I'm just going to share the application form window. Um, can someone type in the chat whether or not they can see this, please? Just to make sure that you can see this Affordable Materials Grants application form. Yep, OK, plenty of yeses. Thank you so much. All right, so when you select the type of grant for this application, this is going to set what the application looks like. Therefore, uh, you want to make sure that you know <laughs> all of your stuff about this application before you start the process. So once again, have your Word document ready before you do any of this stuff. So let's say that I'm going to do a transformation grant project. Uh, the final semester for all transformation grants is fall 2024. If I select continuous improvement grant, I can select whether or not it's summer or fall. If I select a research grant, there are some things that you'll have to answer here about the kinds of research methods included in your project. Again, these are for Excel purposes, for sorting purposes, for tracking purposes, uh, topics in the KU framework, uh, final semester of the project, requested amount of funding, just like the others. I'm going to act like I've got a transformation grant and my uh, requested amount of funding is gonna be $24,000. And I'm going to go to next. Then I put in my name, I'm going to say test here. I'm going to copy this out, put this here, put this here, test at test.com. 
sorry to test.com if you actually are a website. The employee ID is a way for research and policy analysis folks to take a look at whether or not our grants are affecting things over a long-term period in a big way. Uh, employee IDs are not shared out with everybody else. The proposals are shared out with the public. This is not. Um, this only is between us and research and policy analysis. The reason is, well, let's say that you have done some really cool work and you know, you've got your name on like five different proposals and we want to track how that's been over the last 10 years. But you got married six years ago. That's going to, you know, if you do a name change, uh, whichever uh, name you have changed, uh, that's going to affect whether or not we can track your name anymore. Uh, trying to normalize that in research and policy analysis data is very hard to do, but your employee ID does not change. So that's why research and policy analysis needs this to answer that question. So uh, have the employee IDs ready for sure, uh, but these are not going to be shared. And we put this under every single thing that uh, asks for an employee ID, exactly what this is. This is for banner, no cost and low cost course analysis. Um, when we're looking at things like anonymized student success or student retention data. Uh, then we're asking, uh, is the applicant the same person who's submitting the application? If you are a project lead who's an instructor and you're applying, then you are the same. If you're a grants office that is submitting a bunch of applications at the same time, I know Georgia Gwinnett loves to do this, for example, you would click no and the submitter would then be putting in their information too. Uh, but I'll say yes. Now, including the applicant, how many people are on this grant projects team? This is important because you're gonna have to fill out who else is on your team. I'm gonna say that I have two people, me and somebody else. This is a small project. Actually, that wouldn't meet the maximum. I'm gonna say five. All right, now you have these requirements for your name, your email, and then again, we're asking for employee ID, and this part right here is uh, super important. This is the disclaimer for how these will be used. Now, we are not requiring this in the submission of the application. Why aren't we? Well, because if you put in uh, for a team member that you have a student assistant, um, you may not even necessarily have an email. You can put your own at that point but then you wouldn't be able to put in the employee ID for that person, right? So we're not asking for that over and over and over again. Uh, so I'm just going to say all of these so that I can keep moving on. And because of this, I'll be able to not include this test applicant anyway. Go to next. Now the course information, you should already have this on your Word document. Um, you know, put in a course, course title, students per summer, students per fall. I had one saved in here. Thanks so much, Google Chrome. Students per uh, spring. Something to note here, you can scroll to the right. Please scroll to the right and fill out what you can. Uh, the total students per year, so you would add that up. The savings per student, and then the total savings per year. So let's say you're saving 150. You'd multiply it by the total students per year. Now, are you planning on creating, revising, or remixing any OER during your project? Why would we ask that question? Well, if I say yes, things are going to, uh, we're going to make sure that you have uh, some things here that you're remixing or revising, uh, anything that your application meets. Okay, well, departmental scaling, because this is a transformation grant, that's why this asks this. Uh, let's go to the next thing. Here's the uh, Word document upload, the letter of support, the Business and Grants Office acknowledgement form. After this, your application is submitted. I don't have a Word document, letter of support, and all of that stuff to submit, so I will not be doing that part. But after you do that, you will get an email. Um, it will be from Affordable Learning Georgia at usg.edu. It will mention your name and it will give you a PDF copy of the application that you just submitted. Uh, sometimes grants and business offices need that copy. Sometimes it's just good for you to have it. Uh, either way, it'll be attached. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen because I'm seeing that some 
chats are in here. Uh, so team member three might be student assistant one. Yes, that is exactly the point. Uh, put your email address if you're going to do something like that. Um, it says just to clarify, the IDs are found in one USG. Yes, those aren't the university IDs like your ID card or anything like that. It is your employee ID when it comes to uh, you know, your payroll, things like that. Um, yeah, and it is the thing that is in PeopleSoft slash one USG. Uh, Dr. Mayer says when entering enrollment uh, for students per year, do we count dual enroll differently? Dual enroll don't pay for the textbooks, but their institutions do. So OER does have cost savings, but the savings are different. Um, so put in the data the same way. You're not going to be able to indicate that they are du dual enrolled student students there. But put it in your project narrative exactly what you're talking about. Um, we will be able to check exactly what we're going to do with dual enrollment data uh, after that. That's going to be fine. Um, and it does count uh, when it comes to dual enrollment because that's that is a savings that the institution is uh, doing too. It's not something that reduces the cost to students directly. But because the cost to the institution is lower, uh, the whole system of dual enrollment winds up being lower cost. It's it's complicated, but it's one of those things where we really do wish that we saw more OER in dual enrollment. Uh, the SREB, the, the, the multi-state compact for the South in higher education, focuses on the role of OER in dual enrollment. So yeah, absolutely do pursue uh, a project like that. Uh, Dr. Liu says if student assistant can be team member three and we do not have that person identified yet, how can we enter the employee ID? Uh, exactly why we do not have it marked as required on the online application. Uh, you do not have to do that for student assistance. Um, so if you're thinking about how we track employee IDs, right? We're tracking them based on whether or not the courses that you're teaching are affected in ways like grades and stuff like that over a long period of time after this grant has happened, maybe even before this grant has happened. That's what research and policy analysis would love to do. That's why they would like to track employee IDs. Uh, a student assistant would assumedly not be teaching sections of the course. Now, graduate assistants may be teaching labs and they may even be teaching course sections based on uh, you know what what the major is like w what's happening there. That's a very special case. We're really looking at um, do courses taught by USG faculty uh, benefit from these grants uh, kind of in a big giant data way. So yeah, do not enter the employee ID if you have a student assistant who's team member three and you absolutely do not have that person identified yet. Yeah, you don't have to put that in. Okay, I am going to uh, resume from where we were. And resuming from where we were just means I'm at the question slide. So I've already been answering questions, but does anybody else have any questions about the grant process? Um, oh, okay, Dr. Franks has a question about, is there a disadvantage to applying for a grant as one individual without other team members? I think it depends on the project. So. There's definitely a disadvantage to having one team member if you're if you have a proposal that's super ambitious and a ton of work, because if you're looking at it as a peer reviewer and you see all of this cool work and you go, wow, who's going to do that? Well, part of the action plan is assigning all of that work to your team members. If it's just one person who's writing a gigantic textbook um, that may not be something that you could do over a year. That really cuts into the feasibility of the project. And that is part of the evaluation. Um, I think that adding other team members in that case would be super helpful. If it's a nice, sensible, small project and there's one team member doing it, or there's one team member doing it and they've created about 80% of it, it's not an open resource yet, but they're going to make it open. That's totally cool. If it's feasible for one, that's great. 
If you have more team members to help you out, that's even better. Even if you have a, a feasible project, if you can include an instructional designer or a librarian to make things more open uh, or more freely accessible or more accessible to students with disabilities, like that's that's super great. That's something that uh, folks would love to see. So the disadvantage is more in the planning process than it is in some sort of data process. Uh, we're not going to dock you points just for having one team member, but in the evaluation process, we're looking at how feasible it is. I hope that that makes sense. Um, I'm going to be posting the slides in that same place in the uh, apply for a grant page. We're going to have both the recorded video today and the slides themselves. So thank you for asking uh, Dr. Palmer. I'd like to share it with a collaborator who couldn't be present. Yes, exactly. That is why we are recording this. No problem. Uh, Karen says, can we count a faculty member with a degree in instructional design as an ID instead of as a faculty member? Yeah, uh, when when we have our applications, it is part of team members, right? Uh, but when you're talking about the uh, collaborators, OK, so I see. So you have someone in your department. They have a degree in instructional design. And you're saying, is that a collaborative project? Because they are by trade an instructional designer too, but by position, a faculty member in your department. That's that's a weird one. I, I like this question. I've never heard of this before, and that's really neat. Um, I would say go ahead and put it in for the priority and explain in the narrative or explain in the priority section on the Word document why that is that's a really special case and i think it's cool uh yeah that's nice um heidi says i have had issues with students not being able to get hired because of their campus job uh for the last grade it was a limited number of hours is there a way we can do an amazon card or something else per hours for students who have that conflict that is the kind of detail and the kind of question that i would bring to your grants or business office um you know how I was talking about external grants are often treated differently than service level agreements with uh, the USG and they usually should be, but they are not always done. So if we're treated like an external grant, that may be really difficult to do. Um, there's also state guidelines when it comes to things like providing food for folks. Uh, so even a food gift card may, depending on the interpretation by your grants or business office, be a little bit different. Uh, so yeah, bring it to them before uh, you wind up submitting the proposal because that's it's a good question and it's something that will go into your institution's processes. Yeah, cool. Uh, Yvonne says, if if my other team member is at another USG school, is the transformation grant the only grant that's applicable? No, no, no. Uh, it, you can have a cross institution project on any of these. If you're going to build a continuous improvement grant project together and uh, one group is at ABAC and the other is at UGA, totally fine. Same with research, absolutely fine. Uh, both instructional design faculty members. That's really cool. Cross institution instructional design project. Excellent. Uh, Melva says, do instructional designers have to come to, from our institution? No, if you want to collaborate, um, especially with USG folks, that's totally cool. If you bring them from the outside, like I said before, processes differ, but often institutions will bring them in as contractors. Um, Shaina says, yep, thank you for import, uh, for our presentation. Thank you for coming. Uh, Dr. Mazzoni says, if we have low enrollment, can we benefit by collaborating with other USG institutions? Absolutely. And that data would count at both places. Um, yep. Oh, so this was my thank you slide. Can you post your email? There it is. I am at jeff.galant at usg.edu. Um, Nikita is at Nikita Afaha at usg.edu. We also have a catch all. Um, email address at affordable learning georgia at usg.edu just in case yep there we go 
Um, let's see, can we submit same separate grants with the same limitations? Yeah, you can submit separate grants with the same uh, limitations, I believe. Yeah, if you have a, a really specific uh, circumstance here, Dr. Mizogi, please do uh, contact us and we'll we'll work on that. Uh, yep, Todd says we are trying to uh, more accurately track the number. Yep, the number of downloads connected to our OER textbook published by UNG, uh, but some download it through yeah our site uh, oer.galileo.usg.edu. Others do it through UNG. Is there a preferred method how students should download the materials? We don't have a preferred method for that kind of tracking. We are more interested in how it is impacting the students that you're teaching instead of the number of downloads. For example, you download a textbook. Uh, we'll download Intro to Human Geography once, and I'm at CSU Long Beach. I then put it in my learning management system, and a thousand students per year use it in that learning management system. That one download has an impact of a thousand students per year in some place that we don't track. That's super cool. Uh, someone else might download it, take a look at it, go eh, and throw it in the recycling bin. I hope they don't because, you know, it's it's one of ours. But uh, if that's the case, that's a very different impact from one usage. So we're not always looking at download counts. Um, but if you are interested in that, we can give you our analytics through the um, through the reporting tool in our repository, and you can combine that with the UNG analytics too. Oh, uh, Dr. Robinson says, would a transformation grant be appropriate if you want to get rid of commercial textbook and adopt an OER textbook instead? Yeah, that's kind of the classic scenario. Um, how do you find out what textbooks are available for adoption? I would start by looking at uh, the OER guidelines that we have on our page. Uh, so there is an overview to how to find OER, and I will link that one here. And this is kind of a, a basic uh, kind of a blueprint as to how to look for OER. If you want to know more about, hey, what is OER? What exactly um, are all of the underpinnings of Creative Commons licenses and things like that? We have a modular tutorial uh, as well on how to recognize and identify uh, OER. It takes you through seven different ones. Uh, also, if you happen to be in the Momentum U courses, uh, we have an OER course on Momentum U. Uh, yeah, Todd says, we know of some institutions that have adopted it, but others we have no idea. Yeah, it is tough. Uh, it's the same with library resources too. Someone who uses a full text article, we, we, we get a usage count. If someone just browses it and clicks out of it and forgets about it, that's the, measured the same way as someone who browses it, uses it in their research, puts it in their dissertation, gets part of that dissertation published. So like the numbers only tell you so much. All right, well, we are a little bit over time, but that's OK. That's because we had a bunch of cool questions. Thanks so much for being here uh, and so much for being interested. And for the folks who are listening online, thank you for watching as well. I'm going to stop recording now um, and have a great day. <laughs>